Thank you very much. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Every year, the World Wildlife Fund publishes a list of animals in danger of extinction. The most recent list includes the leatherback turtle, the Sumatran tiger, and the Yangtze finless porpoise, but for some reason fails to include the publisher of literary fiction. And yet there is a very real fear, I think, that this harmless, toothless, and largely domesticated creature could very soon be going the way of a dodo. And of course, as a writer, my concern for publishers is entirely 100% selfish. You might compare me to the nematode worm, a parasite that feeds on the stomach of the Sumatran tiger. I feel very much the same as I nuzzle up in the lower intestine of Orion or Walker Books. And of course, my first thought is, if my host is going belly up, what hope is there for me? As we all know, life in the publishing jungle in general, and book sales in particular, aren't looking too great. It's a little early in the morning to reach for the whiskey bottle, so let's nip through the evidence quickly. Borders gone, Barnes & Noble not looking good, sales in US bookstores down by 22% in five years, UK independents in decline, 73 of them closed last year, bringing the figure to under 1,000 for the first time uh, in my lifetime. Supermarkets such as Sainsbury's have stopped selling books, and then there's Amazon. What can I say about Amazon? Here are my favorite facts about them. Amazon began as a bookshop. It was originally called Relentless. It employs just 14 workers for every $10 million in revenue that it turns over. Books only make up 7% of their profits. Within the company, original writing is known as verbiage. Last year in the UK, they paid 2.4 million in corporate taxes against sales of 4.3 billion. Amazon should approach small publishers the way a cheetah would pursue a sickly gazelle, CEO Jeff Bezos said, picking up on my jungle theme. They really are evil bastards, and I loathe them, I fear them, <laughs> and of course I use them all the time because they're wonderful. That's the problem. <laughs> it occurs to me instantly that their, books, their business model is not just a threat to bookshops. I would have said that pretty much all shops are going to disappear in my lifetime, and I don't even plan to live that long. <laughs> And then there's Kindle, Kobo, Nook, and all the other e-books cutting into publishers' margins or cutting them out altogether. Self-publishing, Amanda Hocking, Hugh Howie, E.L. James, finding what they can manage without publishers altogether. It does make me think. I am, I suppose, a brand. Alex Ryder certainly is, and according to the Amazon website, I can create, publish, and distribute my books in print worldwide on my own. I can earn royalties for up to, of up to 80% for my verbiage. It does make me wonder, what have publishers ever done for me? Well, not a lot, obviously. Except, Walker Books did publish me for five years when my sales barely made it worthwhile. It's strange how when I began my career as a children's author, I was treated as a child. Do you think you can find your way back on the tube by yourself, they asked me, <laughs> in all seriousness? I was 27. <laughs> But they published books that only sold five or 10,000 copies, and they always smiled when I came in. And when I finally wrote the book that launched me, which was Stormbreaker in 1999, they knew what they'd got, and they got behind it. They created a jacket that was strikingly, more importantly, a logo that gave my hero, Alex Ryder, both presence and attitude. They gave me a three-book deal and helped to develop the series with marketing, advertising, and launch parties, one in a Cuban cafe, another in the Peruvian embassy. I'm not sure if parties actually sell books. I always have to remember that at the end of the day, I'm the one paying for them. But what do, you, what do you get if you publish online? A cyber party with everyone meeting on Facebook? It rather embarrasses me that she's here today because it's a very good rule for writers never to compliment their publishers in public. But I do have a terrific editor in Jane Winterbottom who has worked on all 10 books and who has argued with me violently, usually about the levels of violence. Walker developed a website to support the books. Later on, they produced graphic novels based on the books, and they've so far rejected the series twice to keep it up to date. The Alex Ryder series has now sold 16 million copies worldwide, and I really have to say I'm sorry that Walker is here because I hate to have to admit how much I owe them, in much the same way But The House of Silk, my Sherlock Holmes novel, owes much of its success to the way it has been packaged and presented by Orion. They've arranged an event at the London Book Fair just two days from now, and we're announcing the title of the sequel. We have a plan a strategy which will hopefully steer the book to success when it is published in October. I love publishers because I love books, and I think they're both undervalued in, the, in this argument about digital publishing. Publishers give me an identity. They give me an imprimatur. Even Fifty Shades of Grey only really took off when it was published by Viking and became the fastest selling paperback of all time. Publishers give me an association. I love being associated with Ian Rankin and Kate Moss at Orion and, to a lesser extent, Wally and Maisie the Mouse at Walker. 
And with my publisher, I'm not alone. Writing is probably the most solitary business in the world. And it's not surprising that so many of us are a little mad. For myself, I sometimes sit for up to 10 hours in a room by myself and I'm lonely. In fact, I'm so lonely when the telephone rings, it's one of those, you know, our cold calling kitchen sales when I actually engage them in conversation. I say, oh, you know, melamine, that does sound interesting. Tell me more about the cupboard doors. Um, but what publishers give me more than anything is books. And by that, I mean books as objects, the vehicles for stories, the finished object that I cannot help turning over in wonderment every time a new one falls into my hands. When I say I love books, I love their physicality. Of course, I use a Kindle when I'm on holiday, but the entire reading experience is different, particularly when page one and page 100 have no distance between them, when apart from a tiny space bar, you have no real indication that you are nearing the end. Turning a page is a vital part of reading. It's an unveiling, an invitation, the typography of a book, the paper stock, the weight of it in your hands are all part of the story it tells. And books, of course, remain in your home as friends. I have books which I value in the same way that I value paintings. My 1946 none such edition of Dickens, for example, with its beautiful shades of color and the single original plate that was included with every set. My signed Ian Fleming. The Sherlock Holmes collection that my father gave me for Christmas when I was 17. The edition of Proust that still taunts me because I've never read it. The battered copy of Dr. Doolittle, which I loved when I was 17. My original Tintin collection, which would be worth a fortune now. All of them first editions, if only I'd looked after them a little bit better. When I write a book, <clears throat> I see the finished item, and I'm aware of the relationship between the book and the text. This is something that J.J. Abrams explored last year in his novel S, which took the form of a battered library book with notations in the margins. Nabokov did something quite like it with Pale Fire. And you could say that Ian McEwan was playing with similar ideas, the book as false friend in atonement. I once had an idea for a book, a mystery, in which the solution would be contained on a couple of sheets of paper concealed inside the cover. You'd actually have to tear it apart to reveal it. The idea was to make you think not just of the words on the page, but the writer who put them there. My Sherlock Holmes sequel does go some of the way towards this, as it contains a quite separate book within the book, again a reminder of what you are holding as well as what you are reading. I remember that almost 50 years ago, when I dreamed of being a writer, it's absolutely true, I used to design the covers and create the books and draw even a little penguin on the spine as a sort of 12-year-old. And even then, the book was as important to me as the story. I do not believe the books will ever die. I can't imagine a world without them. But at the same time, it cannot be denied that we are in a position in a time of extraordinary transition. And it does seem to me sometimes that publishers aren't grabbing the nettle because they're too afraid of getting stung. Why, for example, has nobody yet begun commissioning actual e-books? My Kindle allows me to check the de definition of any word, but I think it could do much more. It could provide illustrations, background research, newspaper articles of a touch of a button. It could add another comment. Uh, it could add an author comment. It could even take me through the story in a different way. I've long wanted to write a detective story for Kindle where if you don't trust a character, you can press down on a word and find out what they're really thinking or what they were really doing when the murder was committed. An e-detective story could actually make the reader work for the solution instead of having it handed to them on a plate. They could become an electronic detective, still reading the book in its correct order, but going places that the less perceptive reader was unable to find. Stephen King once wrote a book in which every page deleted itself after it was read. What a great way to write a novel about an amnesiac. You could write a James Bond novel where you actually get the recipes for the cocktails. Or, as with DVDs, you could get a commentary from the author. It seems to me that anything is possible, but not very much of it is being considered. And this may be one of the reasons why only last week Sir Tim Waterstone announced that e-books will inevitably go into decline. They will if publishers don't recognise their potential. Gabby Wood put it very well in an article in The Telegraph. Publishers have got to stop thinking of their digital products as books and start imagining more expansive ways of communicating information. Until then, the digital revolution hasn't begun. I do not, incidentally, see e-books as being in competition with the printed word. On the contrary, they hugely extend the market. In the four years up to 2012, e-book sales in America went up from 68 million to 3 billion, and surely that's got to be good news. As Jeff Bezos has remarked, Kindle buyers go on to buy almost five times as many books, digital and real, in the ensuing year as they did before. Speaking personally, I'm thrilled by the thought that children can access Alex Ryder on their e-readers, computers, tablets, and even mobile phones, and I'm more than happy to meet them on their own digital terms. I have a website, of course. I also tweet. These days, I'm more likely to visit schools on Skype than I am to turn up myself. E-books are on our side. 
But there is perhaps a greater danger which feels counterintuitive, but which was highlighted by the author Ruth Rendell earlier this year when she talked about the death of reading altogether. She pointed out that, unlike 20 years ago, people no longer feel ashamed to say they don't read fiction. Reading is becoming a kind of specialist activity, she said, and that strikes terror into the heart of people who love reading. Joanna Pryor, managing director of Penguin UK, has also talked about a literacy crisis. Well, there's good news and bad news. I read this week that 96% of students aged 10 and above read at least one book a year. 50 new libraries, 50 new libraries are being built every year. Spending on new books is being boosted 70% to 8.4 million pounds. That's the good news. The bad news is that I'm talking about South Korea. Here in the UK, the opposite is true. More than 60% of 18 to 30 year olds prefer watching TV or DVDs to a reading, according to Book Trust. The National Literacy Trust has also pointed out that around one in five children leave school with the reading ability of an 11 year old. What's going on? Thanks to the demands of the national curriculum, reading whole books for pleasure has pretty much vanished from many schools. Even at Eton, which I visited recently, they only managed one period of silent reading, 45 minutes a week. The shared texts that I was brought up on have gone. Public libraries in this country are being closed, but far more seriously in my mind, school libraries are underfunded and far too many secondary schools have no full-time dedicated librarian. If you don't start young, if you don't cultivate readers, you will pay the price down the line. A recent Evening Standard report stated that one, night, one home in nine in London does not possess a single book. The barbarians are most certainly at the gates and behind them too, as Chris Grayling, our erroneously named Secretary of State for Justice, showed just a couple of weeks ago when he supported a ban on books being sent to prisoners. Books like new socks and cigarettes were a privilege to be earned. Governments occasionally pay lip service to reading as basically a good thing without ever knowing quite why. And Grayling is clearly blind to the redemptive value of literature and its civilizing quality. Of course, governments occasionally pay lip service to reading with initiatives of one sort or another. But I get the feeling that we're moving to a more superficial, hard-edged, harsher society as our values change and we encounter a generation more used to violent computer games than the works of, say, Trollope and Dickens. If I were to sound a warning for the future, it is that we need to nurture our love of reading, and not just of reading, but of literature. Call me elitist and high-minded, but who at the end of the day is actually reading those two writers I just mentioned, Trollope and Dickens, they happen to be my favorites? Is the conversation simply one about volume and bestseller lists, the latest James Patterson, the new Dan Brown, the next Danielle Steele? Not that I'm knocking any of those writers, I'm just saying that if we lose sight of the greatness of literature, its ability to transform and to transcend, if we are out there only to sell, then surely we're wasting our time. Maybe we are heading towards a society where nobody reads, but it comforts me to think that this society will still have books, just as churches have candles, and no matter what shape they may take, stories will never die. I may not be a great writer, but I try to be a good one. And it seems to me that we're very much in control of the time we live in, writing or publishing for a digital age, but it's our age. We can make of it what we will. Thank you.